Welcome to The Last Room, and you are here with Charlotte Moore, and I have with me a special guest today. This is Mays Jackson. He's uh, from WVON. He's also a political strategist, and he's also a media personality. And I know we are just meeting for the first time, but I've also seen him on Fox as a guest correspondent. And am I missing anything? Uh, you know what? Everything from Fox to BBC to CNN, uh, and then I'm pretty regular here on ABC and Fox 32 locally in Chicago as well. Please don't forget to check me out every day, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 on the WVON Morning Show. You can watch us on Facebook Live. If you're terrestrial radio, you can listen to us at 1690 AM in the Chicagoland area. Or you can always go to iHeartRadio and you can catch us worldwide anywhere you're at. But thank you for having me here tonight and I'm happy to be here with you and your audience. Okay, and I know it's also late you guys time since I'm in LA and we just got through watching the last uh, dance documentary that ESPN. Tell me your initial thoughts about the documentary. Uh, I am still on 10 um, <laughs> and I think I'm on 10 because it is just bringing back so many memories. Uh, I, nev I will never forget Michael Jordan getting drafted by the Chicago Bulls when I was in eighth grade. Um, and watching that whole progression. And so as we were watching things that were happening tonight, it was so many things that we remember um, from all of the tumultuousness of the team going up and down. I remember when the Bulls sucked, right? And then from them going to sucking to the gradual uh, progression, and I can't wait to find out what else is happening. But really to see um, behind the scenes. I think one of the things that I'm really excited about with this documentary is the fact that, you know, back in the day, uh, our celebrities and entertainers didn't have social media. So we only got to see Michael Jordan as the crafted image that he allowed the media to see. Um, and oftentimes the people that we love their success, we don't necessarily like the push that comes to get that success. And so I'm excited to see what went on behind the scenes. Yeah, um, definitely. I agree with you as far as he definitely had a drive and a push of demand for excellence. And I don't know if that's what it takes for a six championship. Seems that to me, obviously, that type of personality and attitude got the job done. But what was one of the things that surprised you tonight in the first two uh, parts of the series? You know what? I'm a pretty, I know a lot about Michael Jordan. So I wouldn't say that there was so much that I was surprised about. What I did not realize was how toxic the relationship had gotten between Scottie Pippen and the Bulls and Jerry Krause. I knew Jerry Krause was not a popular guy. Um, and I think the, the other thing is really the dynamics that it took to make all of these people who did not necessarily all get along get together to create this winning franchise. And sometimes you got to break some eggs uh, to make an omelet. And I don't think that's a surprise. Um, but I think that oftentimes when we see these stories, they look like fairy tales and they cut out all of the hard work and all of the, tr the trials and the drama that you have to get through to get to get to the level. Six, everybody wants to have six championships, but are you really willing to do what it takes? And Michael Jordan was the guy who, in my estimation, pushed everybody to their limits. Nobody liked them until that final game when they were holding that trophy. Right. I agree with you on to a extent. It's a lot that you do know about Michael Jordan, it, it, that the crafted version of Michael Jordan and the control. And I know he had control of this narrative as well. They, they said they couldn't release it until he uh, gave the OK. But one of the things uh, I thought was interesting was the relationship with him and Jerry Krause. What that made me think about is how almost it, the dynamic of when they be saying, um, athletes should be in their place. It's particularly uh, the African-American male athletes, you know, put in their place. They, they, they don't need this much power or control. What, do you, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think that um, Michael Jordan in that era is the first time when we really start to see the power moving away from the white front office. Michael Jordan probably had leverage that a lot of NBA players up until that point had not ever had where he could talk back to the general manager. Remember, 
before when Mike and those guys first got in the game, they were making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year. So they weren't. Some people were still working other jobs. It wasn't the big glamorous job that it is now. Um, the thing that I think with uh, Jerry Krause, so I, I'm, I'm torn, right? So I do believe that in teams, there is no I in team, but I also recognize that you have to play to your strengths. And to the Bulls, Michael Jordan was their ultimate strength. I think one of the things that happens and what you saw there was um, a dynamic that we've seen really take a turn now that our athletes are starting to be in a more powerful position. And I think Mike paved the way. Um, what you see with that Jerry Krause piece is the it really goes to the slave slave master scenario, yeah. which is we pay y'all to play ball. Yeah. I can put any one of you Negroes in this spot and I can make a championship team. And I think what we found out, what he found out the hard way was that wasn't the case. Um, I think that what you often see is, and this is probably not politically correct, but particularly in the NBA and a lot of places, you see a lot of smaller white guys who control big black athletes and they feel like they, they feel like while the athletes are running up and down the court, they're doing what they tell them to do. And so I do see some of the old school slavery kind of mentality, but what I do appreciate in this was seeing Michael Jordan being the power, having the leverage, recognizing he had the leverage and use it. One of the things though that is different from Jordan and I'll say even today's players is that uh, and yes, you're, I agree and correct that he paved the way, but he was not as outspoken as, as a political activist or a social activist as today's players. Why do you think so? Or why wasn't Jordan that way since he did have established this type of power? Well, I think first of all, um, I think we live in a different time. Um, and I don't know if the social issues, I'm not saying they weren't there, but I'm gonna say they weren't as prevalent. At that time, black folks were really trying to be middle class, trying to climb and live the American dream. We weren't seeing the murders and the killings by police on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me start there. Let me also say that with Jordan, I feel like they were still products of the media, right? So Jordan still relied on to the, the major networks and ESPN to get out his brand. And remember, he was trying to make the money with the corporations and all of that stuff. Remember, there were, remember Michael Jordan wore a chain and they got mad at him for wearing a chain. There were no tattoos. There weren't all of the things that we have now. And so I think that Michael Jordan was from in the 80s and 90s, black people weren't necessarily trying to blow up the system as much as they were trying to climb up the ladder and become that American model of success. I think Michael Jordan was no different than that. Um, and I also think that with Jordan, as it related to not being politically active, um, they, don't ha they didn't have the voice that they have now, right? Like right now, if 257, back then, if 257 or 9 said, you're out of here, they could just cut Michael Jordan off. They could turn him off, he would never be on TV. Well, now if I'm LeBron James and I got 2 million people or 10 million people following me, I can just go to Instagram and I don't even need the media. I can tell the story myself. And so I think there's, I think it's the era that he lived in, but I also think that now players are much more in control of their narrative because they can go direct to their fans without having to go through a filter. I'm not for sure, and you can help me, but. I wasn't this around the era when um, the guy that was Rodney King, not Rodney King, but in in Chicago, who came before Obama, um, actually um, Harold Washington. Yeah, it was really at the end of Harold Washington. Okay, uh, really, Harold Washington was probably like a four or five year difference. Yeah. So Harold Washington had kind of gone away. This was during the time when Black Excellence was in Chicago. So yeah. now you got Michael Jordan, you got the Bears. You got uh, oh. Oprah Winfrey. Oh. And so at that point, you're not, the black people in Chicago are not the, the activist black people. Those are the examples of black success and black excellence. Okay. Um, can I say that quite frankly, um, I don't think that a lot of our athletes were as conscious 
during that time. Uh, if you pay attention to, if you pay attention to what they were talking about as it related to uh, Michael Jordan's team and the people using cocaine, mm -hmm. and all, I feel like we had left the activism of the '70s and '80s, Got it. Um, and now we were in the materialism of the '80s and '90s, and then I think towards the late probably the late 90s early 2000s is when all this stuff started to come back but i would tell you that a lot of those athletes were always told hey man stay out of that political stuff just be an athlete and on his path to being a billionaire i would say for mike it worked out okay so he shut up and dribbled <laughs> he shut up he sh okay so i would say this okay. i would say he shut up and dribbled i think everybody has their role right mm -hmm. everybody has their role and so would we rather have Michael Jordan 50 years ago, or we'd rather have him building federally qualified healthcare clinics and, and being a billionaire and being able to leverage that? Would we rather have Michael Jordan being the person that took over the industry that he has and hires the most, becomes the first black NBA owner, also then hires the most NBA executives that are black, also then having the largest shoe brand that's outside of Nike, making billions of dollars, hiring people. There's just different ways to do it in my estimation. So we're gonna shift uh, a great part of this documentary that I saw that uh, I hope that they will highlight and profile more of the teammates is they did give the second part to Pippen. And we saw Pippen coming from a rural area in college and in his background, him signing a contract that was uh, eventually i guess considered not the, the best possible decision for him to make at that time what do you think about that what, what, how do you feel about him taking that long-term deal for that uh short amount of money i've been there first of all at the top first of all I, no, I, and honestly i've been there i think sometimes it's a risk reward so mm -hmm. scotty pippen coming from where we saw he came from and somebody putting $18 million on the table and saying, you make this $18 million. Now remember, this is back in the 80s. So that seems like a goo gob amount of money. You take it and you think that you're gonna be straight for life. If somebody tells you, I'm gonna give you $18 million and you making $20,000 a year, you think that's the most money you'll make in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Scottie Pippen was, was betting on security, not recognizing um the long-term ramifications so if somebody tells i just think that scotty pippen was like a bird in the hand two in the bush and then after he signed that deal then the league revenues went through the roof and so he became pissed off but he signed the deal right like the guy asked he said don't sign this and he said i'm gonna sign it because man i'm a, i've been there and so i just think that it is unfortunate because Scottie Pippen is an example of what happens to black people in this game um, who do not have good financial advisors, since etc. And what you see with Scottie Pippen is you take his story out is how many more terrible stories in Scottie Pippen's life that we hear that, about this with his poor financial decisions. Was there anything in the documentary so far that you was hoping they would have shown just early on right now? You know what? I didn't, I, I'll be honest with you. I, what I would like to see is more of what it was like for Michael Jordan making the transition as a person from college, coming, being a country boy, and then coming to Chicago. Uh, I have a couple of friends that were on the Bears that talk about when they brought Michael Jordan into Chicago and introduced him around and kind of, he was kind of like the country mouse, like, whoa, what's <laughs> going on here? And I'd love to hear a little bit more about the story between him and Juanita, but I'm sure they'll keep that out. I know, right? <laughs> I would love to hear that story too. I, I also believe she's a big part of the reason of those six championships. But. That's because, you know what, I think she's a good part of the, let me say this, I think that when we looked at Michael Jordan back then, the media was very controlled. So we didn't know about any of his extracurricular activities, et cetera, um, like we do now, right? Cause somebody, there were no camera phones. I think that Juanita Jordan was a significant part of his success from being with him, not making a stink, raising his kids, doing that whole thing. So I'll give her all of like that. Like you said, she brought a lot to the table for that to be established. Though. You ain't dribble no balls. 
But she probably caught some rebounds. <laughs> She's in the gym at night. But you, you did bring up something that it was uh, interesting when he talked about he didn't want to hang out with people uh, because he wasn't into those things. And then to hear now that you mentioned that he was a country mouse. I was curious, since you were in Chicago around that time, was he involved in the community? Was he like out with like the people? Because he wasn't a superstar then, so. Michael Jordan, so the challenge became that Michael Jordan went from, in the time that he was there, he went from being a country mouse to being the biggest star in the world. And it happened within like a three year window, right? And so what wound up happening was there were the people that knew him when he first got here and he stayed cool with those people, but there were also a lot of people that saw him on his ascent and so he started kicking people to the curb. Yes, he was active. I remember when Hales Franciscan, which was the black boys college, uh, boys high school was going to close, Michael Jordan was the first person to step up and give a million dollars. I live like three blocks from the United Center right now. Uh, the Michael Jordan, James Jordan Boys and Girls Club is right there. There were so many things that Michael Jordan donated to and gave to very quietly, right? And not always Mike direct, but Mike had so much corporate power that he could direct corporations to do work and to help in places when he couldn't. So yeah, I, I would say that he was definitely, um, I wouldn't say he was like the guy that you saw out showing up at all the places. What you knew was his impact was over the city because you could see it by the things that he did. Uh, thinking about Michael Jordan, because uh, I studied basketball a lot, is the Ben Wilson comparison. Or, oh, <laughs> not. No, no, I'm saying, go ahead. I, I, oh. I, I got something for that, though. Okay, well, I just wanted to know because I, I remember uh, my favorite player is Penny Hardaway. So I wanted to know what was your take, especially being in Chicago, you know, one of the meccas of basketball. And, and the one of, the um, mecca, the yeah. mecca, the yeah, you mecca. Know, you know, now you I'm, the most people I, was, in the league. I was raised in Memphis, so I'm not gonna say the <laughs> mecca. And then I also know New York will argue with you too. And then we got Oakland in here. So who do you think is carrying that torch or who do you think during that time was the best player. I always say, if it was a, if a frog had a back pocket, he'd carry a pistol. If it was a fifth, we all be drunk, right? Um, all I can do is talk about what I actually saw. So I've seen some awesome high school players. I've seen some awesome college players. I've never seen anybody play, have the complete package like Michael Jordan. Now, um, and so with Ben Wilson, I'm from Chicago and Benji, is a local hero and i don't think we even need to tarnish his legacy by trying to compare them because they're two different levels J benji is a dream unfulfilled michael jordan is the is the standard right and he's beyond the standard um and so what i think what we probably have to do is stop trying to compare people to michael jordan and that because I think even with all these debates with LeBron, et cetera, if you weren't there part of the magic, like I was watching it with my son and I'm like screaming and I'm yelling, I'm like, look at this. And he's like, dad, it's not that great. And, what? He, he, and, and understand that because in his mind and in his era, right, he saw LeBron, he saw Kobe, he saw LeBron, and now he thinks of Steph Curry and all of those. And it just frustrates me to hear anybody say these crazy things. So what I've decided is I'm through having all these debates with people about who Michael jo who compares to Michael Jordan. To me, there will never be a greater. Uh, he put it all together. He reminds me of Jay-Z patterned himself after, after Mike. And what I say is, is that there's a lot of rap, there's a lot of ball players admitting there's nobody that put it all together and then put the money with it to make it to, to change the way we view basketball remember before michael jordan the endorsement deal the shoe deal was this big now it is people try to get a bigger shoe deal than they do an nba contract that is a very good point that now talent is nothing compared to people um big market <laughs> Yeah, even though Jordan did accomplish those things, that was not his 
on said goal. Like he, yeah, he was smart enough to uh, capitalize and maximize, maximize his talent, but his his whole intent and love for the game was just to be the best. And that's yeah. what I think missing from some of the other in, in my generation today. But I'm shocked that your son was not impressed today. That well, let me not say he wasn't impressed. So that's not what I mean. What okay. I must say is though, he ain't jumping up and down like I was running around trying to slam stuff on the TV. <laughs> like, do you see this? Oh, but it's God. also okay. because I lived every bit of it. Right. Well, I I did every that. single word of it. For yeah. me, it's it's me telling him stories and him being able to put some of those stories together. But to live through that era, to be on Madison, to be in Chicago when you knew every summer that your season was going to June, to the end of June, everybody was barbecuing, there was music. Like, it it was a whole way of life. Yeah. And I think that is what it means to Chicago. I'm glad they finally released it. I think it's a great time for them to release it. I mean, we go from the Clark Sisters to the, uh, the Last Dance documentary. I, mean, I think we're winning for the, uh, at least this month. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I just hope that it, it continues to be better. I would love to chat with you again. So I'm glad you opened up that door. And uh, again, I appreciate you sharing your time. Well, thank you for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you to discuss this, the uh, Last Dance uh, Man, memorable, brings back so many memories. My name is Maze Jackson. I'm the host of the WVOM Morning Show. You can catch me every day, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 on 1690 AM in Chicago. Now, you can also check us on iHeartRadio. Uh, that's WVON 1690. Or you can watch us on Facebook Live and catch the replays on YouTube. You can go to the Maze Jackson page. Follow me on Twitter, at Maze Jack. That's at M-A-Z. J-A-C, or on Instagram, Maze Jackson said. Thank you for having me today, and I look forward to talking to you again. And thank you so much for coming on The Last Room.